My name is George Ginsberg. I'm born in Langfuhr, in Langfuhr, Zoppert, which is about 30 kilometers out of Danzig, Free State Danzig. My parents were Russian immigrants and they escaped from the Russian Revolution and came to Danzig. I was two years old and my parents continued their journey to Berlin, to settle down in Berlin, Germany, where I went to school normal as a normal child, normal amongst other children, and I grew up in Berlin as a Berliner until 1933. In 1933, the Nazis came to power and uh, after a very hectic elections in Berlin. And uh, life just continued because the people did not think it would last long. I myself went to school, I had no trouble, until the year 1938. Uh, when the crystal night occurred. In uh, 1933, coming back to that, I was standing with my father in the main street in Berlin under the Brandenburg Gate, where there was a victory parade of the National Socialist in the nighttime, and they were carrying torches and flags and drums and singing and marching by the thousands through that particular gate. Hundreds and thousands of people were lined up on the streets, including my father and myself. And my father had a sad face. And all of a sudden, I saw my father crying. Tears were rolling down his cheek. And I said, why are you crying, Dad? He said, that is the finish of Germany, and that is the finish of us, Jews. And I said, why do you say that? At the it's a beautiful parade and it looks nice and the drums and the music. And he said, that's the way it is, my son, and you will learn when you get older. And I hold my father's hand tight. And then I understood when the song came about and they were starting to sing that Jewish blood shall flow from the knives. And then us German, we will benefit from it. I couldn't understand exactly what he meant. But later on in school, when years go by, the situation tightened up more and more and more. The Jews were deprived of their rights, of driving motor cars, of having bank accounts, of being able to go to swimming pools or cinemas or theaters. And everything was taken away from them, the rights. I myself was in class. I was already then in the gymnasium, which is a high school. I had no trouble from the kids sitting next to me in uniforms, wearing swastikas and brown shirts, school kids. They were just my friends because I grew up with them, and they made no difference to me. The only thing were the teachers. We had a math teacher called Mr. Böhring. He had gray hair, and he wore the sign of the National Socialistic Party. And there was a question in class, and he addressed myself. He addressed himself to me and say, you Ginsburg, your race is supposed to be so smart. Where's your answer? If I couldn't answer, the class was laughing. And I stood there, and if I could have answered, he said, well, we thought so, you're too smart for your boots. And that is where it started with the teachers, because the teachers were actually instructing their pupils to act. And then after a while, I got kicked out of school. I got a letter thanking very, very much for my attendance, but they couldn't use me anymore. And good luck for the future. And I thought, what sort of a future have I got here? I went on transport, on, on cattle trains, about 80 to 90 in one, one wagon. Women, pregnant women, children, all sorts of things to, to work in Germany or to work in East Germany or in East Poland. We didn't know anything about nothing. 
Five days the journey lasted, few people died on suffocation. All we got was a bucket of water and a bucket to do our business. The doors opened once in the night time after five days. And I would like to mention that when we came to Poland, we saw nuns on the platform asking for our babies to pass on through the window. Nobody could understand anything, but some women, some mothers must have the instinct and they pass tiny little babies of two, three months through the window, through two dead nuns, because they were, they were in, they thought they may be better off there than wherever they were going. Now those babies were known and they were hidden during the war in convents and they were recuperated as much as they could, not all of them, maybe 50% were recuperated after by UNRWA and Joint Distribution Committee from the United States after the war. They were taken out of the convents, whoever knew. We were arriving in Auschwitz on the ramp and there were selections, left, right, right, left. Most of them were done by medical officers, by nurses dressed up as nurses, women as as dressed up as nurses. And the people who have been selected, pregnant mothers, women with babies and others, were taken to the right, they were put in trucks, we never saw them again. We know what happened to them now. They were ex exterminated. The a sad part about it was that they couldn't get quick enough into the showers, so-called showers, because after a journey of five days being filthy, not being washed, they had to undress, they had to remember where they put their clothes, a piece of soap and a towel was given to them, and they rushed into the shower, which, shower rooms, which were actually gas chambers. Us, young people, 240 men and 170 women, that's all there was of 1,060. We came into the camp, we were shaven, we were undressed, our clothes were taken off us, and we were shaven and we were also tattooed. My number is 64,147. I stayed in Auschwitz, I worked hard, I worked on outside lying pipes. The climate is uh, deadly and people died from, from the cold, from undernourishment, from sicknesses, typhus, meningitis, diarrhea, diphtheria, pneumonia, you name it. That was our biggest. During the time in Auschwitz, we constantly saw the four chimneys of the crematoriums. The fire was right up in the sky. They were working overtime, particularly when the Hungarian transports came in 1944. And I think that part of the crime, I personally opinion that part of the crime of the German Nazis, the Allies are also responsible for the death of our people because they never bothered neither bombing the rail route to Auschwitz or any of the crematoriums who were in operation. And they easily could have done that because then they wouldn't have been able to eliminate those people so quick. That's not only my opinion, but it's the opinion of many of the people, inmates who were there, Jewish or non-Jewish. I was strong in will, very strong in will. I was strong in physique too, but that does not help. Strong in physique over there, if you had a fellow who was really a muscle man, they gave him two bags of cement to carry instead of one. So he was in the same boat than a little fellow who was not so strong. I taught English to one of the fire brigades who gave me extra soup because the Polish prisoners did not, did not uh, depend on the camp food. They had parcels from home. The Germans had parcels from home as well. So they did not rely on the camp food at all. So I got more food, more of this, better work, now more people and could circulate. And that helped me to survive. I had a strong will to live. 
and I never doubted that I will see one day the end of those people. And that's what drove me to see the end, to survive them, that they could not exterminate me before. I like to see them exterminated first. In 1945, the Russians were following the Germans. The Germans were already running from the fronts. We saw the fire on the Wissler, which is a river on the right-hand side of Auschwitz. We heard the artillery fire, and the Germans were trying to mine the whole camp. We saw the engineers moving the wires right across the fence to blow us all up, but they never had the time. The order was given to us to go out. Uh, all stores have been emptied. We got plenty of bread, jam, marmalade, butter, whatever we could carry. Sausages. I've never seen so much food in the last three years. People took more than they could carry, they threw it away on the road. They start to march us in the middle of the night through the gate. But this time there was no singing and there was no music. We walked in the nighttime and they housed us in the daytime. In the daytime, they accommodated us with farmers surrounded by SS. They all had dogs, Dobermans and Alsatians, trained on the, on the, on the inmates. And as we were marching in the, in the nighttime, the ones who couldn't march anymore, there was a death squad in the back. They were shooting them, they were giving them mercy killings. They were putting them on trucks. The trucks went in the forest. Petrol was put over the bodies and the trucks came back empty. And so the column went on and on. They, they evacuated us deep into Germany. I marched towards Groß Rosen, and in Groß Rosen, concentration camp in Germany, the ones who couldn't march anymore, they were left behind, we know what happened to them. From there on, we went to Flossenburg. We were not welcome in Flossenburg because we were a burden to them. So we only stayed a few days, we had mistreatments, we had showers, we have been re-equipped, beaten, all sorts of things. And from Flossenburg, we went further and on the route, I tried my luck and on a rainy night, in the middle of the night, I ducked myself and I rolled myself down the hill, down the mountain. I lied in the snow and that way I escaped. I lied there for about an hour. I survived five days in the forest. Don't ask me how. And then I was found by the American forces, which I, I was asked to join as interpreter and, uh, and scout. My father, my father knew Berlin very well. He was a real estate agent. And when things came to, to the, to the, towards the end, in 1944, in March, he was taken away. He was recognized in the, in the bomb shelter by somebody else, denounced. And when he came to have a shower in his apartment, they were, the Gestapo was sitting waiting for him, and he was taken away in 1944, 12 months before the liberation of Berlin and he came to Auschwitz. I did not know about it. My mother has been hidden with German family, friends of hers, and she has been all the time uh, hidden there. And in Berlin they said they called them submarines because they're untergetaucht, you know, they're, they're, they went under. And uh, she was there and she, she came out after the liberation of, uh, of Berlin by the Russians. And I was looking for my mother while I was in Germany I was looking for her, and through some joint distribution committee in UNRWA, they found my mother and have been reunited after seven years with her. And it was a tremendous uh, emotionally meeting between me and my mother after seven years. I'm the only son. And then I took her to Australia with me, and she stayed with me in Australia for 17 years until she passed away.